Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. We've got about another minute or two before we start our session. Um, so I will put myself on mute. If you have any questions before then, please feel free to reach out in the chat or send me a question in your go-to question panel. Thank you. We'll start soon. All right, well, good day and welcome to the National Rural Health Executive Webinar Series. I'm Cody Smith, your Partnership Manager with NRHA Services Corporation, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for today's webinar. Before we begin, let me go over a few housekeeping notes. Uh, first, I just want to let every all attendees know they will be muted during the webinar to ensure minimal background noise. Secondly, our goal is to complete the presentation in 45 minutes with time allocated at the end for questions. If you do have a question for the presenter, please type it in the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll address it at the end. Lastly, this event is being recorded, and you'll receive an email with a link to the recording before the end of the day. Today, we are privileged to have CloudWave's Chief Security and Engineering Officer, John Gomez, as our presenter. I'd like to extend a special thanks to our dedicated partner, CloudWaves and Sato Cybersecurity, for their support and industry expertise in assisting our rural hospitals and clinics. Not only do our partners share their knowledge and expertise with, expertise with us, but they also play a significant role in supporting NRHA's efforts on Capitol Hill and in facilitating our conferences dedicated to rural healthcare. Now, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce John Gomez, who will share his insights on what rural healthcare leaders need to know to advance cybersecurity readiness. Hi, thank you so very much. And uh, as, as mentioned, truly appreciate you all taking time out of your day to join us. And uh, I'll do my very best to hopefully make this a valuable um, experience for you. Um, in today's session, we're going to um, really kind of take a retrospective of view of things we've learned in, in the past several years, but specifically over the past last year related to cybersecurity, and also kind of talk about some of the trends that we see coming down the pike. Um, Ultimately, um, <clears throat> my hope is that you can use this as somewhat of a, um, a state of the union, if you will, and um, kind of help you formulate your 2023 strategy and, and, and hold internal conversations. To that end, we can certainly, if you wish, go deep into the weeds if you want to post a question, but I'm going to try to keep this a little bit higher level, maybe not get as technical uh, as we typically would in a conversation like this, since we're really trying to focus on uh, opportunities for strategy. Um, so with that, um, kind of let's just jump into some things we've seen occurring in the past and uh, that I think are still very important for us to kind of consider and take pause and understand if, if we're repeating these mistakes as we enter 2023 into 2024 and what this really means to us in terms of shaping our cybersecurity strategy. Now, I will say that <clears throat> obviously when it comes to uh, rural health organizations, uh, a lot of what we're going to discuss is related to uh, constrained resources. Uh, so I'm more than happy to kind of talk a little bit about some ideas in regards to um, how can we right size this, right? Because I think one of the challenges with cybersecurity is that we have a set of best practices and we try to do them all. But obviously, if we can't do them all well, um, it, it doesn't really matter ultimately. So we can talk to you a little bit about what can we do to prioritize some of these things and, and really right size it for, for this, uh, in, uh, this industry sector. So it's kind of switching back to key lessons from the past. One of the big things we've learned is that a lot of security in the past, especially past two to three years, I would say, was very reactive. 
Um, and we really, the importance of proactive security is, is critical. And I'll give you a little bit of, of kind of insight into what we mean in terms of difference between reactive and proactive. So, um, you know, reactive is, you know, um, kind of, hey, we've had an incident, we've gotten some type of threat intelligence, and now we're going to go ahead and, and patch everything, right? Or we're going to get everything up to a patch level. Proactive would be a little bit more aggressive in our patching, right? And thinking about how do we not become the victim um, and not just wait for for that threat intelligence or guidance. Now, obviously, if we don't know the vulnerabilities exist because it's, it's a new vulnerability and we don't have patches for it, uh, then we can't be proactive, right? We have to be reactive. But one of the trends we've seen is that a lot of what we do in cybersecurity is just simply reactive. We're reacting to something that's occurred. We're reacting to the latest threat intelligence versus really thinking about what can we do to get ahead of the curve. And again, some of that is challenging in this space, but we can certainly talk to some ideas around that. Um, <clears throat> A big thing is the non-technical aspects of cybersecurity. We've been finding more and more that a lot of the breaches, a lot of things, in fact, we just worked on a breach uh, yesterday uh, that I was actually involved in yesterday where uh, we had a situation where a, um, a doctor's office, an anesthesiologist's office was affiliated with actually a rural hospital uh, in the Midwest. And um, the doctor's office, um, a lot of their payment and billing is done by the rural hospital on their behalf. Uh, somebody got to an email address uh, at the doctor's office and uh, actually got to the office manager's email address. And they were able to send a series of emails to the hospital's finance department and convince them that it, the doctor's office was switching bank accounts and they needed to update their payment information so that any direct deposits um, would be um, would be able to um, to go to the new account. So what occurred from there is, unfortunately, um, the hospital ended up wiring $196,000 to this other bank account, and um, obviously that was the attacker's account. The attacker's account was in Maryland, and um, Long and short of it, um, it was a bad day for everybody. Uh, the reason I bring that up is it really talks to point number two. Like there are this this hospital that I I'm, I'm, you know that we're, we're referencing had all the technical controls in place. They had a, a lot of technical controls. Unfortunately, at this one doctor's office, um, they did not have a lot of non-technical controls. And what we mean by non-technical controls are really things like education, ongoing education. You know, really kind of helping people understand the risk. Um, and if they could have done a little more of that, this probably wouldn't have occurred. Ultimately, what occurred here was the doctor's office was using um, an email system that just probably shouldn't have been done, shouldn't have been used. And I, I won't go deeper into that, but the point of this whole thing is we've learned that you can't just invest in technology. You really have to think about what are those non-technical aspects of cybersecurity, the non-tech stuff that you need to consider as part of your holistic strategy. Uh, security, ongoing security awareness training, you know, user education, C-suite education, boardroom education. And again, for rural hospitals, this can be challenging. But um, one of the big, you know, areas when we talk about how can we do this better is there is a lot of free training. Uh, one thing I will tell you is uh, YouTube has, you know, and I'm not trying to, to play this off in terms of getting professional training in and, and doing security awareness training. But there is a variety of content out there from Cybery, uh, YouTube and others that is high quality and doing something like sending out a quick 10, 15 minute video that's maybe produced on YouTube is a way to help kind of offset the investment you may need to make in, in a more you know expensive or uh, cyber uh, security awareness program. So thinking creatively is one way to kind of address this. Um, one of the big things we've seen is is true realistic incident response plans. We, we see that those kind of fall short. In fact, I just had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with with a CISO where, uh, from a very large hospital that basically said, you know, I, I find the incident response plan to be kind of silly at this point in time. And I think that he was spot on. Uh, one of the challenges we've seen is that having, you know, re incident response plans versus realistic incident response plans is a world of difference. Understanding, you know, the speed and velocity or what we call violence and velocity of an attack is critical in, in how you determine how you want to deploy your incident response plans. And one of the things the lessons in the past have shown us is most incident response plans just are not designed to be really supportive of the current threat landscape. And then testing those plans, having a tabletop, 
Um, a tabletop you know, simulation doesn't have to be the most expensive endeavor. We do tabletops, love to do them for you. But you know, if it's economically constrained, having a simple lunch and learn and just going through an attack, kind of dissecting an attack on your own, um, is, is, an, is an effective tabletop, right? It's great to bring in outside parties. Like I said, we'd love to do it, but maybe that's not always plausible. So doing something simple um, where you take an attack and you just examine, hey, what happened at this other organization, whether they're in healthcare or not, and what would we do if that happened here, play, pays a lot of dividends. And it's a really effective way. It qualifies as a tabletop for HIPAA. Um, so just kind of an idea there, right? But testing your incident response plans and being realistic are critical. Um, you know, ransomware, and we'll talk more about ro uh, robust backups, but one of the big things we've seen is that there is a solid sense of security when it comes to backups. Um, and, and we find that kind of backups are the one area where being more old school could be, you know, a lifesaver for you. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we see a lot of people, you know, hey, I'm gonna, I, I back up to the cloud, or I have a, you know, some type of uh, multi-tiered backup system. And the challenge with that is that we don't really understand how attackers uh, operate. And so we're, we feel that we're backups are safe, but in essence, they're not um, because of the way the attackers approach an attack. I think, and I'll, let me just spend a moment on, on what I mean by that. So about three or four years ago, what we saw when we saw ransomware or any attack against an organization, a healthcare organization, is it was kind of an immediate thing, right? Somebody clicked the link, went to a website, downloaded something, and immediately the attack ex, uh, executed. And that kind of worked pretty well for the attackers for quite some time. What we've seen in the last year or two is a shift in how attackers uh, operate. And that big shift is important to understand because it has direct implications on your backups. What that shift is, is the attackers no longer immediately execute the attack. They still uh, assume you're gonna download or click a link or, or open a web page or do some or install some software you shouldn't install. And what's gonna occur is they're not going to execute the attack. They're going to try to establish a foothold in your environment. And what we've learned is that most attackers are in your environment about 197 days, that number fluctuates year to year, um, before they actually execute the attack. So the question is, what do they do for those 197 days? Well, what they're doing is learning your environment. They're moving very slowly. They're scanning what type of systems you have. They're monitoring what type of software is in the environment. They're basically creating a very custom attack against your infrastructure. And while they're doing that, they're also finding a way to corrupt your backups and really mess with your data. So what happens is, yeah, your backups work as designed. They're doing really, really well. But the data that's being, back is, or being backed up is already corrupted, right? They've already found ways to mess with the ones and zeros so that basically you're backing up bad data. And this brings us to the concept of restorations. Most restorations we see are not real restorations. Somebody takes a backup, they restore it in the backup software. The backup software says, yeah, you're good to go. I was able to restore that. But they don't go all the way to actually restore the data and have somebody view it in the actual production system right, or a test system, right, an actual test system. So you have an EMR, I actually restore my stuff to an EMR training or test system. I have a clinical application analyst or somebody look at the data and say, yeah, that data is fine. And that missing, that little piece, that extra mile, if you will, kind of becomes a really bad day when you have a ransomware attack and somebody runs into the CEO's office and says, hey, we're okay because I've got a backup system and we invested all this money on off, uh, out, you know, cloud-based backup or whatever. And now you go to restore and find out all your data is corrupted. And that was the attackers working in your environment for six months and they took out your backup systems. And this has now become a standard practice for what we're seeing. So having a very robust backup system this is a key lesson from the past that we've kind of learned. Um, threat landscape, understanding it. Like just what the short story I shared with you, taking time to really understand that threat landscape, to really kind of understand how attackers work, critical in kind of how you're going to determine your strategy. And I think as an industry, we probably don't do a lot to really help equip people in the industry, such as yourselves, with here's what the attackers are actually really doing. Like we hear the term, oh, there was a ransomware attack, but what did they really, really do? And we don't have to get into all the tech details, though I would love to if you want to, but just give you enough to say, okay, that's that's an issue. Like what I just shared with you about, hey, I don't know how many of you knew or didn't know that they're probably gonna be in your system for 197 days and they're probably gonna go after your backup data and corrupt it so you're backing up corruption, right? So then we can have conversations around, well, what can I do to detect them and why aren't they being detected for 197 days? One key I will tell you, 
most attackers that are detected within 100 with, when they're in persistent right they, they're not immediately executing attack one of the two ways that we see them being detected the most number one honeypots and number two um, is humans right because people invest in that non-technical training or awareness and somebody sees something on their computer or in the network and goes oh that doesn't seem right I should report this and then they investigate it and go oh lo and behold that's an indicator of compromise so that's kind of some again understanding that threat landscape and continuously monitoring right <clears throat> we still see a lot of organizations that don't have network intrusion detection don't have in host intrusion detection they've deployed some endpoint stuff they deployed antivirus uh, but they're not really monitoring the environment and so even again you know there's a lot of resource and financial constraints in this sector even if you just do something like deploy honeypots maybe you can't do deep packet inspection and host intrusion detection and all the other kind of cool stuff but at least think about maybe i should put some honeypots in my environment right if you got a mouse at home what's the best way to catch the mouse you know put out some mouse traps right um it, it is a great way to, to to know somebody's ferreting through your network uh, little by little over a period of 100 days and suddenly they hit a honeypot and now you have an indicator that there's something going on here. So something to think about, it's a cheaper alternative than the full-blown um, deploying an entire monitoring platform, if you will. And this one actually, again, yesterday I had a call on this topic where hospitals, I'll speak to this because you may be interested in doing this or maybe joining this effort. Uh, here in New Jersey, I was approached by, uh, by an organization and saying, hey, you know, we've had a few hospitals here in New Jersey that have had ransomware attacks. One of them is a really notable attack. And the big frustration is that when these attacks occur, you know, there's no information sharing. And so other hospitals get kind of concerned around, well, what do I need to do to protect myself? How did that attack occur? And is it ongoing? And is it a, con a clear and present threat? So here in New Jersey, we're going to experiment with, I have a call actually tomorrow morning uh, to talk to a, a series of CIOs on this topic. And, and I, I urge you guys to, to think about, is this something you would want to be involved in? Is finding a way that if a, ta a hospital is attacked, and could they report to a kind of a broker, a middle, you know, a, an independent middle party, anonymously that, hey, we've been attacked, here's what we know to now, here's what other hospitals need to understand. So that every other hospital can then be notified, and in that notification process, they could take steps to protect themselves before they fall a victim. Because we had a situation here in New Jersey where we do believe strongly that if that information could have been shared, a couple other hospitals could have been spared the same attack. And that's where the genesis of that is. So Something to think about is how can you do information sharing and collaboration? Now, obviously, there's a lot of hurdles there. The attorneys get involved. Uh, cyber liability insurance gets involved. So there's a bunch of things, but we're trying to figure out a package where somebody could be that broker. And right now, us as a company, CloudWave is experimenting, exploring, could we be the broker and kind of be that neutral party where we don't divulge who reported the information to us, but we do make others aware of this is happening right now. It's in your geographic area, and you need to be aware of it. So just something to think about. Um, <clears throat> and then IoT devices, this has become a big thing. Um, you know, we kind of think about IT as a classical, um, you know, set of systems, whether those are servers or network infrastructure, but IT has become a bigger challenge. And the specifics around IT within a hospital, again, are, are, are starting to cause more and more problems and headaches, um, especially as some of those IT devices used to be people complained about physicians introducing medical devices and IT not having any understanding that those medical devices were brought in, we're now starting to see physicians or, or other clinicians or other members of the staff bring in IoT devices and not think about it. We had one situation where somebody brought in a PlayStation into the hospital. Uh, it was a bunch of EMTs and paramedics who were stationed out of the hospital. They didn't have much to do at night and they brought it in. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't secure the system properly and somebody pivoted off the, uh, the PlayStation. So things like that are becoming much more challenging to the, to the landscape. So that's kind of what we've seen in the past. And uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about HIPAA and how this contributes to some of the challenges. And what we've seen in HIPAA, um, and this is directly related to kind of where we are with cyber liability insurance. So this will feed into that. But I think it also is part of why we've seen the lessons from the past evolve. One of the big problems with HIPAA, and I hear this a lot when I present to boards and C-suites, uh, is that somehow in their mind, a lot of people equate if you're HIPAA compliant, which I'm not really sure what that means, but if you are HIPAA compliant, then you are secure. 
And I've had this conversation where I've presented the boards and what they'll say to me is like, well, you know, we're HIPAA compliant. So from our perspective, I don't really think we need to be spending more money in this area for cybersecurity because obviously we've passed the HIPAA compliance or we've addressed our HIPAA risk gaps or whatever it may be. You know, we had somebody come in and do a risk assessment and, you know, we passed. The problem is that if your litmus test is HIPAA, then you know HIPAA hasn't been updated in years, probably almost a decade, I think, or more. Um, so you're basically saying, well, we're good as of you know 2011 or something. You know that's when this was relevant, but we're now in 2023 and we have no real new guidance. And there's a bunch of other things that HIPAA falls short on, right? It doesn't protect human life, right? So if we start talking about medical device security. There's nothing in there that really specifically addresses that. So having HIPAA as your litmus, or we're HIPAA compliant, so we're good, or we did our HIPAA assessment, we only have a few gaps, or you know the gaps we have aren't really critical, or whatever, um, is not a good way to do this, right? It, and 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 the insurance companies are uh, got burned on this. This is what kind of happened and led us to, if any of you had to get new insurance or looking for new rates, you probably have realized cyber liability insurance is through the roof. And not only is the rates high, but they're dropping people for non for for not not complying with a security best practices. Um, and it, if you you know don't disclose fully where you stand, it, it, it could also get you dropped. So what, how did this all come about? Why is it that for several years, our cyber liability insurance rates were actually really low and really easy to get? You had a one page document, you gave it, you filled it out and they gave you a, a policy. Now, you know everything's through the roof. It's not because of inflation. And secondly, because and you have to fill out like this this basically treatise on everything about your environment and, and how it operates. So what was the change, right? Well, the change was when cyber liability insurers started about four or five years ago, um, insurers kind of fell for the HIPAA myth, right? They were like, hey, this is awesome. Yes, there are some attacks in healthcare, but this is a regulated industry. They have an entire regulation called HIPAA around privacy and security, and they all have to be compliant. All hospitals have to be compliant to HIPAA. So this is a no-brainer. We can go sell them insurance, and our risk is really low because they've got all this stuff that they have to do for HIPAA. Well, unfortunately, insurers found out the hard way what I just told you. HIPAA compliance is not HIPAA. It does not mean you're secure. It doesn't mean you've even embraced current best security practices. So Insurers kind of woke up to that and they realized like, wait a moment, this is this is ridiculous. So we're going to change our, our rate uh, coverage policies or color, coverage um, risk models. And what we've been seeing lately is there's um, about 12 things that we consistently are starting to see come out of insurers. And I'm not going to go through all these because uh, one, it would take a long time. But each of the items here on this slide, and I'm happy to to have the slides sent to you. So if you'd like them, you're more than welcome to the slides. Um, are the key things that insurers are looking for? And obviously, and 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 you know, the challenge here is that these aren't inexpensive, right? There are a lot of things here that do require budget. Some of these things you may say to me, well, this is really hard to get adoption. Now, I will tell you one of the things that you want to be careful of is multi-factor. We have seen the uptake on that throughout the industry to be very high. We're seeing a lot of hospitals have a lot of success deploying multi-factor housewide. And we know there are hospitals out there that are saying, well, my physicians won't go for it. Um, and, and, and that may be true, but I think that we need to start looking at those hospitals who've had 100% success rates, because that number is growing of the amount of hospitals that do get MFA. But even if you can't do it for everybody, at least get it done for admin and, and privileged accounts, right, and the, the IT team. The point of this is the reason we've seen the shift is because insurers now are, are looking at uh, hospitals through a much more you know realistic lens in terms of who they are in terms of risk. So you can use this as a checklist if you wish. Uh, again, you can have the slides, you can take a picture of the screen if you want. Um, but these are the key things that if you're, this is kind of your foundation, if you will. Like if you are a hospitalization, you're trying to figure out what do I need to go do? You know, this guy on the phone or this guy in this meeting just said HIPAA is not really secure. So what do I gotta go do to secure myself? These would be the 12 things I would tell you to figure out, right? These are kind of the, the, the core foundation of what you should think about putting in place. Um, so I, again, you can have these slides, but that's kind of where we've seen insurance shift and why kind of those lessons from the past that I've, I've outlined probably have evolved, right? And mostly, unfortunately, it's because we had a false sense of security in HIPAA and what that means. 
Um, so what trends are we seeing? So let's say you can get that foundation in place. What other things do we need to think about or be aware of as we go forward? Uh, APIs are becoming a bigger thing. Now, in your situations, you probably don't need to worry about APIs in terms of your hospital you know, creating APIs, but your vendors probably are using application programming interfaces. It's probably how they're interacting with other systems. And you know, even things like HL7 and DICOM could be considered an API. So you needing to really think about asking vendors you work with, how are you securing your APIs? You know, are your APIs going to become a pivot point where somebody gets to your application, kind of like SolarWinds and some of the other things we saw happen, and pivot into my environment, right? How do I need to be concerned about? So any kind of external programming inter interface, huge. A big one we're seeing from a liability perspective is executive-led risk management. Um, we have seen, and I think this is true in many organizations, and I think this is an opportunity where smaller uh, hospitals, rural hospitals, have really a, a much easier way to kind of outpace larger hospitals when it comes to executive-led risk management. So what do I mean by this? This is where the C-suite, the CEO or others, delegate you know, security, cybersecurity completely to the CIO, the director of IT, the IT manager, the CISO. And I mean completely, like they don't, they just know we have a security program and, you know, I spend money on it, but, you know, I think we're pretty secure. Go talk to my CIO or talk to my director or whatever it may be. That is not a defensible position. And what's happening is after you have a breach and the civil lawsuits come, guess who's being subpoenaed? It's the CEO. It's the COO. It's the CMO. It's the CNO. There's no reason to subpoena the CIO or the CISO or the IT security director or IT manager in most cases because they do understand. But what if you're an attorney and you follow a civil action lawsuit, what you want to demonstrate is that the leadership of the hospital, the, the top dog in charge and the board had no understanding of cybersecurity. And because of their failure to understand and prioritize cybersecurity, this led to a breach, which then led to harm, right? Now being a little dramatic, but what I want you to take away is this is a shifting trend. We are seeing that it is not defensible for a C-suite executive to not understand the risk from cybersecurity, especially when it comes to things like medical devices and patient safety and care. We do an, actually an entire discussion on the impact of this topic to patient care and mortality. And, and that's how serious it's become, right? It's become a very, there's now studies on the mortality of cybersecurity uh, events. Um, cloud native breaches, you know, this is a big deal. Half of all breaches in 2022 were because of the cloud. So I get this question a lot. Well, does that mean we shouldn't move to the cloud? Does that mean, you know, the cloud isn't as secure? Is the cloud secure? Should we move everything to the cloud? I don't think those are the right questions. I think there is a reality here, which we can talk to, that you're going to move to the cloud whether you want to or not. You can say that you're not going to, but there is an economic investment uh, incentive for software vendors, right, to move everything to the cloud. So if they're going to move everything in their environment to the cloud, you're eventually going to be in the cloud. Right. There's no like we're way past the days of, well, I'm just going to run my own infrastructure and I'll never move to the cloud. What's going to happen is you're going to get to a point where your platform can't be updated, where there is no support for it and you'll be end of life. I mean, it's just reality over the next three to five years. Um, so you need to understand cloud security and how cloud vendors are securing their environment. And what does that mean to your risk? Because whether it's in the cloud or not, the data is your data and you will have liability for whatever occurs in that environment. One thing I will tell you is I sometimes hear people say, well, you know, Amazon and and Google and, and, and Azure are all HIPAA compliant, so we're okay if we move there. And just to give you an insight, they're only HIPAA compliant until you touch their environment. So if I gave you a virtual machine from, from Microsoft and said, here's a virtual machine, and you took that virtual machine and you didn't change it in any way, shape, or form, then you are HIPAA compliant. They are HIPAA compliant by default. If you change something on that virtual machine, meaning you install some software on it, now HIPAA compliance is on you and you're back to now I've got to manage this infrastructure. So just something to think about, right, is understand the cloud mechanics because that is going to happen. It's, it's nothing to do with where I'm at, with the company I work for. Maybe show you this on pen and paper and the economics and the incentives to vendors to just move their stuff off prem and move it into a cloud environment. Personal supply chain threats. This is becoming a bigger issue and work shortages, traveling nurses, all of those challenges, COVID, all of that is creating a bigger issue here and headache for you. Uh, personal supply chain threat is really where we see um, the technology deployed on somebody's mobile device or home system, if they're kind of coming working remotely and they're using their own laptop to VPN in or something. Um, 
that is becoming a bigger threat. And so I'll give you kind of the, the TikTok story, right? We, we, I think most of us know that at least from a national security perspective, TikTok has been said, hey, you can't install TikTok on any device if you're employed by uh, the federal government in an intelligence capacity or defense capacity, right? That's generally speaking their policy. Now, I think it's important for us as healthcare organizations to understand like, well, wait a minute, are you saying that if I employ an app on a phone, even if I have VPN or even if I have something else that I'm using, that somehow deploying that app can compromise the security of what I'm using in my sandbox? And apparently the answer to that is yes, right? Because if the government, if the national security groups are worried, right, the intelligence community are worried that deploying something like TikTok could open up the rest of their system to security threats, and so the, the answer is don't deploy it, that is kind of the same concern for us. And that's gonna become a larger challenge as to how do you manage the personal supply chain, somebody's personal device. This was an, uh, an issue kind of a few years ago, right? And then we said, oh, well, let's just use VPN or VDI or do other things. And now we're shifting back to, well, even with those technologies and mobile device management and everything, we're still seeing that personal devices could be a security risk um, to, to individuals and then to the hospital, right? So this is probably gonna be a big challenge. We are seeing some trends in terms of vendors. We're seeing vendor consolidation be a big thing. Um, most organizations, according to Gar Gartner, I think on a worldwide basis across all sectors of business, um, most organizations deploy between 16 and 20 different security tools. The big challenge is there is what Gartner found is only 23% of all organizations worldwide who they surveyed actually fully deploy the security tools they own, which is rather interesting, right? So most organizations buy 16 to 20 uh, security tools, software, and then only 23% actually fully deploy it, which leads to a false sense of security. So thinking about how can I work with a single vendor or at least minimize how many vendors I work with from a security perspective is a trend that we're starting to see. We're starting to see fully integrated platforms, single source solutions, kind of the same evolution we saw with EMR, right? We go back of several years, a decade, we see that there was an ED system and a separate lab and a separate order entry and a separate clinical documentation and that kind of all came together under one umbrella. And we're seeing the same thing in security, right? Where people are kind of creating that single pane of glass, you know, one sole source vendor. And, and honestly, that's what we do. That's our big kind of thing is having a single pane of glass for security fully managed uh, across a single vendor platform. We are seeing SIMs kind of slowly die, uh, especially with this consolidation and the single pane of glass. We're starting to see that SIMs just don't have the, the ability to maintain um, the, the complexity required for current threat landscape. So we are seeing, so I'm not telling you to get rid of your SIM. I'm just saying if you haven't bought a SIM, you may want to look at other alternatives than get a SIM now. Uh, if you do have a SIM and you're, you're thinking, well, wait a minute, what do you mean by that? There are a lot of new things that are out there, especially things like security orchestration and endpoint protection. There's just, the move is much more towards these active and, 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 and proactive security models versus the SIM, which is, is quite reactive. Not saying you should get rid of it. There's a lot of analytical value to the SIM. Um, but if you, you know, if you, again, if you're not, don't have one and you're looking at what do we do to, to, to de deploy a security uh, tool set, you may want to look for things, other things, right? Well, hopefully you would look at us, but there are others out there that, that kind of do the consolidated security picture. We kind of brushed on this one, uh, the idea of uh, disaster recovery not being as effective as we wish. Well, especially when it comes to backups. So one thing we are seeing is cybersecurity and disaster recovery coming together as one group. Now for you guys, some of you may have one person that's doing both already. So you're kind of ahead of the curve. The, the, the big change we're seeing is in institutions with, with much larger IT departments, they may have two or three people on business continuity and disaster recovery, and then two or three people on security. We're seeing those groups come together. So I think the lesson is, that ultimately you want your disaster recovery, your business continuity, and cybersecurity, your, your, your plans, those three plans, to be one. And the reason for that is if you ever have a real incident, um, there are two things that you're going to kind of have to think about, right, keeping this really short. One is containment prevention. So containment is can I stop the attack, can I contain the attack? At some moment in time, you may come to the realization during the actual attack that I can't I can't contain this thing. It's moving too fast. So then you go into prevention mode, right? You're going to start shutting systems down <clears throat> and trying to prevent further damage. 
once that occurs, you're going to immediately be in recovery. And so that transition and possibly having those activities happen simultaneously is really important. And it really kind of pays dividends in terms of uh, your revenue and missed revenue, because if the hospital goes, uh, has to shut down, the faster you can be at that kind of continuity and recovery, the, the better you're going to be in terms of your financial health. Um, so these things coming together are, are absolutely critical. And this kind of to the last slide where we talk about vendor consolidation, things like security orchestration, and automated response, all of those things kind of play into this, how quickly can I get the environment back up? And there's a bunch of best practices. Some of them are real simple, get some baselines in place and, and keep them offline so you can recover from, from gold images and things like that. Uh, but this is coming, you know, kind of coming more and more of an integrated approach. Um, so quick trends, you know, what are we seeing specific to healthcare? Well, medical device security continuing to be a hot topic and, and one that a lot of people just aren't really thinking about specifically. Uh, we're starting to see liability related to medical device security. So what I mean by that is whether there's actual attack on some medical device or not, if medical devices get hit, understanding the impact of patient safety and care is absolutely critical. So having plans in place where your clinical rapid response team has been trained appropriately, where you understand things around informed consent. Uh, there's a whole kind of body of knowledge now, which I actually we, we started building in 2013, uh, that has really become kind of critical to understand. And I think as you see 2023 obviously evolve into 2024, medical device security and the liability associated with it will be something you really need to think about. You know, if, if you only had one pile of money and you said, what do I do with this? My suggestion to be, Go address those 12 things that I put on that slide earlier that insurers are worried about and medical device security. Try to get those two things right and spend what you can in those two areas because those will pay the biggest dividends in terms of your defensibility. Uh, obviously, if a medical device gets hit, there's going to be impact to patient safety. Uh, and, and so anything you can do to kind of um, not only protect that from happening, but how do you respond to that, right? What is your professional response to a medical device security incident? really important thing to think about and, and obviously we're happy to help you if and there's a bunch of free content we've developed to answer those questions so it's not always about a contract and i'm always happy to take calls from people and i've had people send me stuff and go can you read this for me and see if it makes sense i'm always happy to pitch in as much as i possibly can if that helps you um so this is something that i think is kind of a leading edge and you probably heard something about it um and that is you know kind of what's going on with ai and so, you know, back in November, <clears throat> there was a, a program deployed called ChatGPT. Whoops, sorry. And um, ChatGPT was deployed, uh, as I said, in November. It's since then become the fastest adopted software in the history of mankind. And, and I think we will look back on this and go, wow, this, was, this changed everything. Now, you may not feel it day to day, um, but it is changing the landscape of everything we do. If you have not interacted with ChatGPT, I highly, highly suggest that you go to openai.com, click on Try ChatGPT and play around with it. Uh, I will give you some insights. ChatGPT sat for the medical boards and passed on its first attempt. Uh, it has passed its uh, uh, legal boards, lawyer, uh, the lawyer board, um, yeah, the, uh, attorney boards. Um, it has um, done a bunch of things that are kind of pretty interesting. Um, so with that, I played around with it. I'll share with you some of the things I did because I think there's some misnomers on there. Uh, it's, you know, I've been told, oh, you can't write malware with ChatGPT. You actually can. You just have to know how to structure your question. So what you see here on the on the screen at the top is um, me asking ChatGPT in the orange, um, hey, can you write a Python program for me to identify SMB shares on a network? So as we know, SMB shares are, are one of the great ways that ransomware spreads on a network. <clears throat> and so ChatGPT gave me a little bit of a warning, but then it did write the program. What you see in the bottom there is actually a Python program that ChatGPT wrote from scratch by me just asking for it. And that program actually does go across a network and catalog all SMB shares and save them to a, a, a CSV or an Excel spreadsheet, right? So then I went in and I said, okay, well, can you update that program you just wrote for me um, so that I can give it a range of IP addresses, right? Can I go in there and just say, hey, scan everything from, you know, for this slash 24 network? And it said, sure, here's an updated program. Now, one of the things that's kind of cool where you start seeing the intelligence is that it remembered what I was referencing, right? So can you update the above script? It knew what I meant. 
So it, it actually has awareness in terms of the context of your conversation. I then went in and said, you know, can you add, add in error handling and logging? And it did. It went in and said, yep, yeah, here you go. I'll add in error handling and logging. Now, what happened, this whole thing happened in a matter of like three or four minutes. So within three or four minutes, I have a complete program that could I could deploy on your network that would scan your entire environment, find all your SMB shares, store them into a CSV file, and probably if I wanted to say, hey, email that me that file, which would be a pretty very serious security risk for you because the next step would be how do I exploit those shares? So to that end, I said, how can we optimize that code that you just wrote? What can we do to make it better? And it came back and said, well, you could probably use concurrent connections. We could probably look at credentials. We could look at security issues, right? It kind of said, hey, here's some security. You know, let's look at security issues that we may find as we're scanning. Let's figure out a better way to do output. Let's look at this SMB version. Um, and let's validate the IP addresses as we're scanning them. So I'm like, well, that sounds good to me. So why not go ahead and add those recommendations to my code? And it did. So now I have a piece of Python code that not only scans your SMB, but looks for SMB that has security vulnerabilities and it's doing it in concurrent. So what I just developed is the foundation of ransomware, right? And the reason I'm showing you this is because I think this does change the threat landscape, right? The game has suddenly changed. And regardless of what chat GPT does to protect itself from people like me, at the end of the day, ChatGPT is based on something called GPT 3.0. And I can get GPT, which is the raw engine. What's protecting you from, from me is the chat interface. So if I remove that chat interface and as an attacker just use the AI learning model, I can do the same thing. So the idea that, hey, it can't develop malware, it just means that you don't really understand how this thing is structured and you're not giving any respect to the audacity of the attackers. So at this point in time, yeah, there are definitely, in fact, I just participated on an, on an article that hopefully will come out in a few weeks discussing what attackers are doing with artificial intelligence. And it is a very scary proposition. And again, if you don't have that foundation built, then you're going to be way behind the curve in trying to defend yourself against AI-based attacks. Um, so I said, hey, you're amazing. It said, let me know if you can work, uh, if, I, if there's anything else I can do for you. So that was pretty much, you know, five minutes of my time. To be honest with you, I am a programmer. If I had to write that code from scratch, it would have took me three to four days. The way I think you use ChatGPT is it helps you establish a foundation. I can learn and then I can evolve from there, right? And I can continue to guide that program and, 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 and test and learn from it. So one of the things I want to talk to you about is um, one thing we've started to kind of help with all these myriad of issues and help you guys figure more out and, and learn more. Um, so we've uh, started something called the Cybersecurity Insider Program. It is completely um, free for you guys. Uh, so we do monthly talks now. Uh, they're on a variety of topics. We just did one on all the, the really went deep on disaster recovery strategies and kind of what works and doesn't. Uh, we're doing one this coming month on what we can learn from the energy sector and how we can take some of their key uh, best practices and apply them to healthcare and do it in an economically friendly way. Uh, we're going to have the FDA hopefully join us in the June, July timeframe to talk about myths and reality related medical devices. We hear a lot like, well, you can't patch the device or you can't add updates. A lot of those things are myths. So we're going to just try and get it from them and have them address the team, the group. Uh, we've got well over 150 or so, close to 200 members now. It is free. Uh, we're going to put, a, there is a link in the chat window uh, that you can just click on and register. There's a lot of other stuff we're doing to this. We have a security operations center called the CTOC. Any threat alerts that come out from our CTOC, we will make available to members of this group. We usually do charge for that and we're waiving that. There are some other events we're going to be doing. We're going to uh, have one where one of our one of the people that leads our penetration testing team is one of the most famous hackers in the world, a gentleman by the name of Hector Monsegur, who is the co-founder of Anonymous. Uh, that's who leads our pen test team. And we're, so we're going to have like an afternoon with a pen tester kind of thing where you can really talk to an actual attacker and, and kind of get some insights into how they think and what you need to know. Um, so and it'll be a lot more. So please feel free to join that. Um, you know, we just kind of talk through this stuff. Uh, oh, we are talking April 27th about cloud versus on-prem. What are the things we've learned there and what can you apply to that that world? So we'll be talking to you about some of those challenges and, and concerns. Um, but with that, I hope this gave you a lot of food for thought, right? My goal here was not to help, you know, solve everything, but to kind of give you enough of a 
of a kind of an overview of what we've seen happen, what we're seeing happen, and what we think is coming to give you some um, some ideas on how to kind of maybe think about what you want to get done in 2023. So I don't know if we have any questions or not. If we do, I'm happy to take them, uh, but I do truly hope this was valuable for you. Yeah, thank you so much, John. It was a very informative presentation, lots of information. Um, I do have a couple questions and I will open up the floor for more questions. So like I said at the beginning, if you have anything that comes up you wanna ask or go over, please add it to your um, go-to panel question portion and I will go over them. So to start out, we have a question. Uh, it says, the issue with the backups, would having an immutable storage solution in place prevent that? Technically the backups shouldn't get changed, but once they are restored, are we back to being infected? Yeah, I think what, so if I'm understanding the question correctly. Um, so wait, repeat that question again. I want to just make sure I, I didn't <laughs> miss one piece of it. Yeah, absolutely. And also, um, uh, Mr. McCurdy, if you would like me to take you off mute so you can ask, we can do that too. But it says the issue with the backups, would having an immutable storage solution in place prevent that? Technically, the backups shouldn't get changed, but once they are restored, we're back to being infected. So the immutable should help, it, it, depending on the, how the attacker operates. So I think, yes, immutable does work. I, I like immutable for things like your baselines, because immutable can get really expensive really quickly. And um, so if you have things like, hey, we're going to take an image of our, of our servers, we're going to take an image of our, you know, our configs, we're going to keep an image of our, um, our laptops, whatever it is. So you have, let's say, four, five, six images that are your baseline gold images, and those are going to be put into immutable storage and you're going to have some kind of policy that says if you know if we update significantly these these machines we're going to update our baselines and before i put them into the immutable storage i'm going to scan them for viruses and make sure that they're 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 copacetic then i think immutable can work really well there i'm not telling you not to do immutable for everything but i know for some immutable can get really expensive but the nice thing about that strategy is if you do get hit part of the biggest pain we see people go through is rebuilding all of their systems from scratch I think one of the big challenges, like when we get called on incident response, the very first question we ask people is like, hey, do you have your baselines? And they're like, what? They're like your baseline images, like do you have those? Because we're going to rebuild from those. And they're like, no, we have backups of our data, but we never have the baseline. We never backed up our baselines. The problem with that is, let's say you have a, I'm making up some numbers here, but let's say you have even, you know, 50 or 60 or 70 servers and you're building all those from iron you've just now prolonged your recovery process. And again, time is money. But if you said to us like, hey, we can probably just recreate all those, those systems, you know, especially if they're VMs from our baselines, now you're kind of cooking with fire, right? Now we can add the data back to them and get them to where we need to be and we can do patching if we have to, but it speeds up that recovery process. So having those baselines there, really important. Going back to the question about, well, are you still infected? If the attacker, if the attacker got to your data before you backed it up, then yeah, you're probably still going to just be backing up corrupted data. Like when I've done when I've done this for real in terms of showing people how this is done, what I do is your your original data as you're moving it, we we corrupt the data and then you basically are backing up corrupted data. So what the, the goal of the attacker is to get to your backup and destroy it before you back it up, right? It's 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 giving you that false sense of of hey everything's good. So yes, immutable storage, if you can afford it, great way to go. But if the attacker's gotten to your data before you've even created that immutable copy or even a traditional backup copy, you're still going to be in a situation where they've, they've, um, you know, they're probably going to win. Right? Oh, and this is what I want to say. The reason I brought up baseline. A lot of people think that, you know, the attackers aren't destroying the hardware, right? One thing to keep in mind, like there are a lot of attacks out there where it's not just ransomware but they actually will destroy the hardware. If you think about to the nuance attack that took place years ago with not pet you, that actually destroyed the system. Like they had to get brand new hardware. Um, and so you have to plan for the fact of what happens if our hardware gets taken out, right? And, and how do I rebuild from completely from scratch? So that's kind of, again, back to, back, back to the baseline. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but great question. Uh, if there's others, happy to take it. Yeah, absolutely. There's there you keep coming in. So let's keep going. Medical device vendors are notorious for not doing any sort of updates to their devices when it comes to security. Is there any push to make vendors more accountable to stay up to date with patches? 
So I want to clarify that question because I think um, I guess I'll, and, and you know this would be a great thing to ask um, when we have FDA come in. Um, but so here's what I will tell you. Um, and I'm talking about this. So we as a company have a memorandum of understanding with FDA. So we are the ones that get called if there's a national security event against medical devices. And so we also work with medical device manufacturers in terms of helping them secure their devices and develop designs. So I'm just trying to qualify what I'm about to say to you. There are two things to think about in that question. I think it's a great question. First one is the liability of the medical device is never the medical device manufacturers. So if a device is not patched, and that device has a security risk, it is on you as a hospital to disclose that risk to patients. And we can get into a long conversation on that, but you know, if, if, if you look at what happened at Spring Hill in Alabama, the entire civil suit that came from that was because there was no disclosure of an attack. And it's a big deal. Uh, and, and again, this is a rabbit hole because it gets into things that are related to cyber liability insurance and non-disclosures, but you need to understand that the medical device liability is ultimately on the hospital right? Because the patient has no voice with the medical device manufacturer and you're basically assuring the patient that they're going to be safe. So that's one thing to understand. It's a big quagmire, right? And this actually takes us back to why C-suite needs to be understanding cybersecurity risk because they may not get the fact that, hey, you know, you're ultimately on the line for this stuff. So that's one side of that equation is the liability and the responsibility of the healthcare organization and a lot more we can talk about there. The other side of that is, well, what if the medical device manufacturers are just not, not developing the patch, right? Like what if they're just taking their sweet time and not getting a patch out the door? That's a lot harder to control because there are, there are um, you know, challenges in some situations of getting the patches done and assuring that the system still performs, that that's their big quandary, right? So if I patch this thing, have I done enough quality control checks to assure that I'm not gonna end up impacting patient safety. So it's a very hard job, right, to think about that. Like, okay, I got to make sure that these devices, all whatever it's doing, like right, actually we're doing a pen test on a, on a robot next week. So what if I have to patch that robot, right? And that robot is, is really sophisticated in doing uh, neurosurgery. And so probably not something we want the best manufacturer to just throw a patch out, right? Um, we want to make sure that that patch is going to be fully tested and that is not going to disrupt that patient care, especially because we come back to the first part of that equation, which is the hospital's liability is ultimately the hospital's liability, right? So it's a really hard thing. I will tell you, yes, FDA has been really, really kind of championing, hey, if there's a, a critical patch, get it out there if you can do so safely. And so they have been putting pressure on medical device manufacturers to try to do that. But everybody kind of um, recognizes that ultimately the hospital is kind of the last line of defense and they have to act in a manner that defends the patient. One defense that doesn't work is going to court and saying, well, you know, it was the medical device manufacturer, they didn't create a patch. That, that's a really bad place for you to be on a stand and be in the position. You don't want to have that day. Another thing I will tell you, one tactic that does work, if you have situations where you're trying to get a patch and the medical device manufacturer is either telling you one of two things, hey, you can't patch or you void the warranty, that is a big problem. They can't tell you that. If there is an available patch and you can apply it, they cannot tell you that putting patches in place will void warranties. Now, if they tell you patient safety is at risk, that's a different question. Um, but they can't do that. That's one of the big myths out there. So one thing you can do if you have a, a, a medical device that has a security risk and your vendor is not cooperating in any way, shape or form, go to your general counsel and tell your general counsel, send this vendor a letter advising them that this device is causing a significant patient safety risk and you're making them formally aware of the fact that this patient safety risk exists within their device. And that usually gets a lot of attention because it's coming from your attorney. Um, so that's one strategy you can use. You know, it, it's heavy handed, but many times warranted. So hopefully that helps. Great, thank you. And another question come in. Did you have any insights or lessons learned from the Common Spirit Health and the Universal Health Services attacks that have taken place? Um, so when you go, yeah, I mean, we can talk about this for a while, but as long and short of it is when we look at it, that those are good examples of situations. Uh, I, you know, I'm happy to talk about, I, I don't want to really, given that we're, I think we're recording this, are we? Yeah, it is. So yes, let me talk are. about this offline. I'm more than happy to take that if you guys want to reach out to me directly, because there's a bunch of things I could talk to that. What I will tell you is basics matter, um, you know, continuous monitoring matters. 
non-technical education matters, those are critical things to kind of understand from those. <clears throat> we see that in, in pretty much all big scale uh, responses that we see. So I'm sorry I can't go more deeper into that, but I'm, I'm just happy if you reach out, I can share stuff. Wonderful. Okay, and finally, what are your insights into performing a cybersecurity peer benchmarking exercise? <clears throat> uh, so we're big fans of maturity modeling. Um, so I think it makes a lot of sense to figure out your maturity. Um, we use the Department of Energy's C2M2 model um, when we're doing either HIPAA assessments or risk assessments or just doing maturity modeling. I think that having performance benchmarks it, it is a kind of like the next step. If you can get your maturity model and then figure out your performance against the maturity, it's great. It's a very advanced and, and mature approach. Uh, what I'll add to that is one thing I will tell you we shouldn't do is I'll hear this a lot, especially boards and C-suite, um, is, well, what's what's so-and-so hospital doing, right? Like, what are other hospitals? Can you tell me, like, where other hospitals my size are versus us? So that kind of benchmarking, really bad. Do not do that, right? I mean, you can do it if you're just doing it to have fun, but never make that your official strategy, right? Or how much are other hospitals spending on average for cybersecurity? And I'll tell you why. So let's pretend you get depos depositioned, right? You, you have an event, there's a civil action, patient got harmed, you're now deposed. And you get asked a question, so explain to me how you came about your security budget or your security risk management or prioritization or whatever the question is. And your answer is, well, we looked at what other hospitals were doing and we try to at least be as good as them. My next question to you is gonna be, did you visit those hospitals? No. Well, how do you know what EMRs they had? Did you, and even if we said, well, I'm looking at other hospitals that run Meditech or something, right? Um, okay, well, what version of Meditech? What is the skill set of their security team? Do you understand um, the minimum qualifications for the people that they hire? Are they the same as yours? Are you having the same security requirements as them from a hiring and staffing? What's their security awareness program? How deep did you dive into looking into this other hospital and how, how well does that reflect your exact situation? The reason you don't want to do that is because you have no real insight into what that hospital is facing day to day. So for you to say from a security perspective, we're going to become just like them, unless you really know them and you can defend all those situations, it's a real bad place to be in a courtroom. You need to really look at your risk and your situation and your your environment and what that you know environment is made up from and, and, and your level of experience and then kind of build your strategy from there. And that's more defensible because then you can say, well, we did what we did because this is what we're dealing with. So we see that a lot um, and never, never really goes well. It's an old school approach when you're saying, what are, what are other people doing? We saw that like when people were selecting EMRs, like, well, everybody's buying Epic or everybody's buying Meditech, so you know that's a safe bet. Not a good thing when it comes to cybersecurity. It's a very different, different mentality. But I understand why people think that. Hopefully that was helpful. I'm not sure if I answered the question, but hopefully it did. Great. Thank you so much, John. That kind of wraps up our QA portion. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for our participation to make today. As a reminder, a link to the recording will be sent later to you this afternoon. Um, also, I, will, I know John, I'll send you that email address so you can follow up on the one question. And everyone, please stay safe and have a wonderful day. Thank you.